Hello, my name is Angelo Garcia III from Future Environment Designs. I am the primary training instructor and chief cook and bottle washer for Future Environment Designs. The Future Environment Designs is a 32-year-old business that provides asbestos, mold, and OSHA compliance training to the construction, utility, and general industry. Purpose of this video is to answer a few questions regarding respirators. Since respirators are used in various industries as the last level of preventing exposures to various contaminants, many people are not familiar with respirators and the various different types and the hierarchy of their use. One of the first things I want people to realize is that we're not uh, talking about face coverings. Face coverings are not respirators. All right, face coverings is something that the CDC is requesting people to wear at this point uh, during the COVID coronavirus pandemic, and primarily for the purpose of reducing the potential of uh, big droplet dispersal uh, in public areas, in areas where people are congregating, like food stores, grocery stores. When they do the shopping, face coverings are being used pretty much like a face shield. It is meant to cover your nose and your mouth so that any big droplets that might be in the air and some of the small droplets might be in the air, if they land on your face, the face covering will basically protect. The other thing face covering is doing is protecting people or preventing people or reducing the amount of times people touch their face. With a face covering, they're gonna reduce the amount of time they're going to touch their face because the, the face covering is there. All right. Now, one of the things about face coverings that I want to cover, um, though it's not part of respirators, is realize that they have to be washed. Once you basically bring them home, they should go in the laundry or they should be washed immediately to clean them. Uh, so like that one bacteria doesn't build up and two realize if it did protect you against some droplets and stuff, those droplets are now on that cloth and you touching the cloth will get the will get that virus on your hands and now the, your hands if you didn't wash your hands after you took the respirator off after the face covering off excuse me then you would basically uh, be recontaminating yourself so that would be another thing you would have to do is you take the face covering off you basically put it in the laundry you go and wash your hands immediately soap and water for 20 seconds and basically make sure your hands are dry all right, so we're not also covering surgical masks. Surgical masks are not respirators, all right? They too are not respirators. Surgical masks, their intended purpose is for fluid resistant and provides the wearer protection against large droplets, splashes or sprays of bodily or other hazardous fluids and protects the patient from the wearer's respiratory emission. So it protects the patient from the wearer is admission all right respiratory admission so in other words that's the reason why the doctors and nurses wear a surgical mask during surgery so that the patient who is open and maybe cut open and exposed and if the doctor coughs or the nurses cough none of those respiratory emissions will get on the patient all right so surgical masks are not respirators. Again, they're meant to basically deal with these droplets and prevent them from being distributed into the air. N95, N95 is a respirator and is a respirator that has been designed uh, and tested by NIOSH to make sure it does what it says it's supposed to do. So as you can see on this chart, it gives you exact differences between surgical masks and N95 respirators and tells you a little bit about those N95 respirators. When you select a respirator, one of the first things you need to make sure of when we select respirators is that the respirator has been certified by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, most of us call it NIOSH. It is a federal agency under the Department of Health and Human Services and under the Centers for Disease Control. NIOSH is NIOSH's job is to, when in regards to respirators, is to test the respirators and make sure that the respirator is capable of doing what the manufacturer claims it can do. So, I'm a say I'm a manufacturer of a respirator, 
and I would say that the respirator is capable of doing 95% uh, of particulate matter. I have to submit that respirator to NIOSH. NIOSH then tests the respirator and certifies that the respirator is capable of doing what I said it's capable of doing. So that is what uh, the purpose of NIOSH is. So if a respirator does not have that certification, you cannot use that respirator in the United States. All right. So in the United States, all respirators have to be certified by NIOSH. So as a manufacturer, I will submit my respirator to NIOSH and get it approved. And then I can sell that respirator as a NIOSH certified respirator. Now NIOSH has certified a whole bunch of different types of respirators. And they fall into pretty much two categories. You have your tight-fitting coverings, such as your half mask, your full face respirators, which most people recognize. Obviously, an N95 respirator or a dust mask is another name for this, or a filtering face piece respirator, which is what OSHA calls it. All right? And you have a quarter mask, which the quarter mask is the lowest level of protection. You then have your filtering face piece respirators, which are next. Half mask is the next level of protection. Um, and actually, uh, for the purposes of OSHA, a filtering face piece respirator and a half mask are both certified for assigned protection factors of 10. Though for certain types of contaminants, you cannot use a filtering face piece respirator, for example, asbestos. Asbestos, you're not allowed to use a filtering face piece respirator at all. You're only allowed to use a half mask or a full mask respirator. Disposable respirators are not allowed to be used for certain types of contaminants that you may be exposed to. All right, so this is the first, first thing you need to know is that you have different types of covering, right? Covering being what's covering the face. So you have the two categories, which the first here is tight fitting. And the second covering is your loose fitting coverings, right? So these are like your hoods, your helmets, and your loose fitting face pieces and full body suits. All right, so these are the next level of protection. They're actually, um, they're actually depending on the type of uh, covering, uh, they may actually be below, uh, between the half mask and the uh, full face uh, tight fitting respirators. So it, it's all about the assigned protection factor for the respirators. Uh, but what happens is with loose fitting coverings, one of the advantages of loose fitting coverings is, is that they do not have to be fit tested. All right, so you do not have to spend money to get these fit tested. While tight fitting coverings must be fit tested. All right, so loose fitting coverings do not have to be fit tested but your tight-fitting coverings do. When we start talking about the individual respirators, we have your filtering face piece respirator, which is the, also known as the dust mask. Uh, and actually, it's been known as a dust mask for a long, long time. Um, however, uh, back in about 1990s, uh, OSHA changed the name of this uh, respirator from a dust mask to the filtering face piece respirator, or as other people know it as an N95 respirator. And as you can see, here are two types of N95 respirators. Uh, you have the one on the top, which basically does not have a button in the center, and the one on the bottom, which basically has the button. The difference between the two is that the button on the bottom is an exhalation valve which allows that allows when you breathe out the air to escape outside of that filter all right and so that type of a uh, uh, respirator uh, usually used in the construction industry primarily because it's cooler uh, when you exhale if you can imagine exhaling with a tight fitting covering with no exhalation valve you exhale your exhalation air is going to be warmer and because of that your face will end up being warmer and so the exhalation valve on the filtering face piece respirator on the bottom there would basically keep the respirator cool and make it easier to breathe. Now filtering face piece respirators are typically considered disposable respirators and only in cases of emergency of short supply are you allowed to reuse these respirators. Typically you put the respirator on, you use it for a period of time, and as soon as you take it off, it goes in the garbage. 
It is a disposable respirator and is not to be reused. All right, and there are specific ways you have to put the respirator on. All right, uh, you're not supposed when you take it off specifically. You're not supposed to touch the actual face piece. You're supposed to take it off from the rubber bands and take it off of your face with the from the straps that are on the back of the mask. And that's where you're supposed to take the mask off because obviously the filter has collected whatever you were uh, concerned about, and that filter is now has the contaminant on it and if you touch it with your hand you're going to get the contaminant on now on your hands all right so that's a, a filtering face piece respirator these are typically also called disposable respirators and that is because as soon as you take them off there's to be disposed of for medical purposes you cannot have the exhalation valve uh, because the exhalation valve would basically create a path of, uh, would create a way for splashes to get into the mask um, so that uh, exhalation valve would not be uh, would not be approved for uh, for hospitals, uh, hospital and healthcare settings. Uh, ideally, you should be wearing the uh, the one without the exhalation valve. Air purifying respirators with an, is a respirator with a air purifying filter, cartridge, or canister that removes specific air contaminants by passing ambient air through the air purifying element. All right, so you have a specific cartridge or canister that will filter the air. That cartridge canister is color coded so that people can understand what type of cartridge you're using. So purple magenta is typically the cartridge color that is used for HEPA filters. You then have uh, other filter colors like black is usually for organic vapors, uh, yellow is for acid gases, and there's a whole bunch of different colors and different charts. Um, and again, we're not going to get into that detail here. That additional, this is just to talk about the different hierarchies. But just remember the color of the cartridge uh, or the cartridge you use has to be specific to the contaminant that you're basically wanting to protect the worker from. All right, so you basically don't want to use a particulate filter if you're worried about chemicals. Uh, you need a chemical filter for that. Like uh, if it's organic vapors, you would need a black cartridge. All right. Sometimes in some situations, like 9-11, uh, ideally you need not, not only a HEPA cartridge, but you also might need an organic vapor cartridge or an acid gas cartridge, um, which would basically protect from other contaminants, not just the uh, particulate matter which was the dust and stuff like that all right so uh, so when we talk about air purifying respirators the, what you're seeing here is a full face air purifying respirator uh, you do have a half face air purifying respirators uh, and um, basically all of these things rely on a cartridge or filter to purify the air the next respirator is a powered air purifying respirator the advantage of these respirators is they have a battery and a fan which does all the work for the user. So the battery runs the fan, the fan draws the air across the purifying element and then blows the purified air into the face piece whether it's a uh, tight fitting mask like a half mask or full face or it's a loose fitting mask such as your loose fitting helmets, your, your helmets and your hoods. So now with these type of respirators, the big advantage of these respirators is, is that they're under positive pressure. And that means that no air is gonna leak into the mask. So all the air is being blown into the mask and the mask is under positive pressure. So if there's a leak in the mask, the leak, uh, the, the, the air will leak out of the mask, not into the mask. And that is a good thing. Now, again, still, if it's a tight-fitting mask, it must be fit-tested. Loose-fitting masks do not need to be fit-tested. All right. So, uh, again, so these are powered air purifying respirators, otherwise known in the industries as PAPRs, or some people call them PAPRs. Uh, but they're a very, very good respirator. They're, in my opinion, they're one of the best respirators for the, for the price. Uh, they're fairly expensive. But because of the fact that they're under positive pressure and you can use them with hoods, helmets, and um, loose fitting face pieces, the worker does not have to be clean shaven 
to wear this type of respirator, to wear a loose fitting respirator. Remember, tight fitting respirators, you must be clean shaven to wear a tight fitting respirator. We'll get into that a little bit later. So the next thing we have to decide for air purifying respirators is to decide what type of filter, canister, or cartridge we're going to put on the uh, respirator. All right. So when it comes to chemicals, chemicals are color coded, as I mentioned before, and you need to know what chemical you're going to be uh, trying to protect the worker from. So if you have acetone in the air, you would need a black cartridge or an organic vapor cartridge to protect from acetone. And that would be the cartridge that you would use if you're dealing with chemicals. So chemicals, you have to know what chemical am I exposing the worker to and then select the filter based on that chemical. When we're talking about particulate filters, all right, in the sense of dust, uh, asbestos, lead, those type of things, silica, those type of things. The next, the first thing we have to decide is what type of uh, contaminant are they being exposed to in the sense of particulate, but is there an oil mist in the air in addition to the particulate matter? And if there is an oil mist in the air, then we want to, we need to select a respirator that is either that is resistant to oil or oil proof versus one that is not. So when we talk about particulate filters, the letter in the front of the filter, N R or P, tells you whether the respirator is resistant to oil or not. Right? So an N respirator is not resistant to oil, an R respirator is resistant to oil, and a an P respirator is oil proof. And the difference between an R respirator and a P respirator is, is that the P respirator is allowed to be used for multiple shifts and there is a process for determining when a cartridge should be used up um, for particulate filters. So a P100 filter could be used for multiple shifts and usually the general rule for, uh, for those type of filters is if once it becomes so hard to breathe through or the breathing resistance has become so hard that you feel like you're running, you're, you're out of breath, then that would be a time to remove to basically change the cartridge and cartridges can also get dirty and they can become damaged and obviously those would be other times that you would replace the cartridge so the next decision you have to make on particulate filters is what is the filter efficiency i'm trying to achieve so what filter efficiency am i achieving do i need a 95 a 99 or a 99.97 percent of filter efficiency so that's the next level of decision making we have to make when it comes to particulates is to determine what type of filter efficiency we need. Out in the field, typically I've only seen, in my experience, I've only seen three types of filters being used out there. You have your N95 filters, which obviously they're not resistant to oil, and most of them are usually on uh, filtering face piece respirators, right? So where the filtering uh, face piece respirators, where the filter is the actual um, material that you're, that you're wearing. So an N95 respirator, again, remember N95 respirators or filtering face piece respirators are disposable. So they're, once you take them off, they go straight into the garbage or wherever you're, it should be properly disposed of, all right, for your facility. Um, so again, remember N9, N is not resistant to oil and N95s basically provide you 95% protection uh, protection against particulates. And then we see the R99 respirators. That's what I've seen pretty much. And again, these are also typically filtering face piece respirators. And again, they would also be disposable. And then finally, your P100 filters is what I typically see out in the industry. And again, P100 filters are typically in cartridges or canisters. All right? I very rarely see a, a, a filtering face piece respirator as a P100. And in some senses, if you think about it, it, it a, a disposable respirator is supposed to be disposed of. So you would never have a P100, which allows you to use it for multiple shifts as a P100 filtering face piece respirator or disposable respirator. Why would you create, create a, uh, a filter medium at that level where you're not allowed to use the respirator for multiple shifts? So we've already talked about the 99.97% filter, but that filter is considered a HEPA filter. All right? So a HEPA filter is a high-efficiency particulate air filter 
that is at least capable of filtering out 99.97% efficient in removing monodispersed particles of 0.3 micrometers in diameter or greater. This is also the category of the 100 class of filters. So you have your N100, your R100, and P100. Your P100 filters are your basically high level filters and this is the highest level particulate filter and and these filters can be used for multiple shifts however in many industries for example the asbestos industry and the lead industry where you have to decontaminate from the area that you worked in that decontamination process usually you dispose of these filters and these filters should not be reused in those situations where you have to decontaminate if you have to decontaminate then those filters should be disposed of as asbestos waste or lead waste or uh, whatever other situation you would have where you could not reuse this because of the decontamination process and all respirators are assigned protection factors and this is how we determine the hierarchy of the respirators all right so a quarter mask, as you can see, has an assigned protection factor of five. A half mask air purifying respirator has a half has a protection factor of ten. The if you look at the footnotes, you'll see that a disposable respirator or a filtering face piece respirator also is categorized as having an assigned protection factor of ten. So that's the reason why the quarter mask is below the filtering face piece respirator uh, the good the advantage of the quarter mask is that it's reusable but it's a quarter mask and it, quarter mask only covers the nose down to the upper uh, to the bottom lip and it's a little gap right here and doesn't sit on the chin um, from from what I've seen at the respirator is very uncomfortable to wear and typically uh, does not get the best of give you the best of protections which as you can see from this assigned protection factors that were given to these respirators uh, the quarter mask is only a five while a half mask is ten uh, obviously the higher the number the better protection the respirator gives you right and so a full face air purifying respirator would give you a higher protection than a half face air purifying respirator that's 50 and then you get into your powered air purifying respirators whether you have a half mask or your full face obviously your full face gives you one of the highest levels of protection as i said before powered air purifying powered air purifying respirators give you one of the highest level of protection for the what the money can buy all right so you can get a really good level of protection from a PAPR and, and it's, as you can see you, a, a thousand protection factor means that it'll reduce whatever contaminants are in the air by a thousand all right so that gives you a high level of protection high level of comfort because of the air blowing in and like I said it's one of my favorite uh, respirators and as you can see you can get these respirators and the helmet or hood and loose fitting um, and then the manufacturer has to certify the level of protection uh, that these respirators get but as you can see here the assigned protection factor for these respirators are, are 25 so they're kind of in between the half mask and the full face respirator um, but if all you had to wear was a half mask respirator uh, you could basically get use these to give you uh, a little bit higher protection and because they're positive pressure respirators and they don't they're loose fitting and they don't have to be fit tested individuals can have facial hair and use these types of respirators and then you get into your supplied airline respirators and your SCBAs which we're not covering too much here um, I basically do mention them a bit uh, in the next slide uh, but these respirators are typically used in very special situations primarily because supplied airline respirators either need tanks or compressors to supply the air and they must supply air that meets a grade D uh, grade D breathing air quality which is based on the compressed gas association association uh, SCBAs are the ones that you see the firefighters wear and these also I'm not going to cover because those are used typically in specialized situations so these are your IDLH respirators uh, typically used for areas that are immediately dangerous to life and health atmospheres that's what IDLH stands for all right, so you have your full face piece pressure demand 
self-contained breathing apparatus, which is certified by NARSH for a minimum service life of 30 minutes. And then you have your combination full face piece pressure demand supply to airline respirators with an auxiliary self-contained air supply. And again, like I told you before, I'm not going to talk about these respirators because these respirators are typically used in very specialized situations and they're not all that common. Uh, this is not like something you're going to be using uh, out walking in the streets. Uh, the firefighters obviously are known to use the SEBAs. Um, and then, like I said, the supplied airline respirators are typically used in very specialized situations. Uh, I've seen them used in spray painting boots where you're basically some of the spray paints are very, very dangerous. And so basically uh, that type of respirator uh, will provide air, uh, bring air from outside the work area into the worker, into the worker's face masks. So some key points to remember for tight fitting respirators. The worker must be medically cleared to wear the respirator. Respirators will provide some resistance, some breathing resistance, even an N95 will provide some breathing resistance, and individuals with heart conditions or asthma or allergies may find it hard to wear a respirator. In addition, if an individual is claustrophobic, that person may also have a hard time wearing a respirator. So. Uh, Anyone wearing a respirator, a tight-fitting respirator, must be medically cleared to make sure they can wear that respirator. All right. In addition, the respirator, once they're medically cleared to wear the respirator, the next thing you have to do is find out what's the right size respirator that that worker needs. All right. And the way to do that is you either do qualitative fit testing, which is the picture at the top, or quantitative fit testing, which is the picture at the bottom. All right, both of these fit testings have to be done before the user uses the respirator in a contaminated area because you need to find out what size respirator the worker is capable of using. The tight fitting respirators come on all different sizes. They come in small, medium, large. Some respirators are extra large. You then have some that are medium slash large. So there's a whole bunch of different sizes that, come, that the respirators come in and you wanna make sure that the respirator actually fits the user. Because one of the things about negative pressure respirators, which is your typical air purifying respirators, is, is that all the, you wanna make sure all the air goes through the filters. All right, and you want to make sure that all that air goes through the filters and the only way to make sure of that is to make sure that the respirator has no leaks in it. And that is what the qualitative fit testing and quantitative fit testing does. It tests the respirator to see if there's any leaks and if there's any leaks, you try a different size mask or you adjust the mask to basically make sure the user it puts it on correctly and when he puts it on correctly, you then test it to see if there's any leaks. And if there's any leaks, then you go to a different size or you make further adjustments. All right. So here at Future Environment Designs, we do quantitative fit testing. Uh, we can do qualitative fit testing. We typically use the irritant smoke method. Um, most people prefer the Bitrix or the Saccharin. Uh, however, we, we only do uh, the irritant smoke method. The quantitative fit testing is what we're really proud of. Uh, we have two machines. We have the QuantiFit, uh, which is the more, more modern machine. What the picture shows you there is OHD's Fit Tester 3000, uh, which is the older machine. We have both machines. Both machines, we get calibrated through OHD, and uh, they're required to be calibrated once a year uh, at the manufacturer. And then we basically do quantitative fit testing Quantitative fit testing actually gives us a number and tells us how good the mask actually fits the user. And we do this quantitative fit testing as part of our courses. Uh, we can do that as part of our course or we can do it separately uh, on separate individuals. Uh, we can invite individuals here to our office and we can fit test them here. Or we will also go to the workplace and fit test the workers Typically, though, we need a, mo a minimum of five people to go out to the field to fit test. Um, and then basically, uh, if you don't have those five, obviously you can come into the office here and we fit test a, a, the individuals here uh, in Syosset. Uh The other thing we do is we do fit testing after our courses or in lunchtime or at the breaks. We will do quantitative fit testing of anyone who attends training. Uh, obviously, there's a fee for this, uh, for the fit testing and um, you can contact us and we can give you a price for that. 
All right. So in addition to fit testing, then so once you've fit tested the worker and you've determined the size mass that the worker can use, the next thing, next step is that you have to train the worker and you have to train the worker on how to use and take care of that respirator and the proper use of that respirator. And that training has to be done initially before the worker uses the respirator and then is required to be done annually thereafter. And that fit te that training can be done either live or uh, in person. We do that here at Future Environment Designs. We do uh, instructor-led courses for uh, for um, for respirator training, and we also have an online e-learning course for respirator training. Uh, you can basically take either of those, and that would provide your workers with the training that they need to basically uh, to use a respirator. And then finally, there can be no facial hair that interferes with the face to face face-to-face -face piece seal all right so if I'm wearing a tight-fitting mask I cannot have any facial hair between me and the mask all right so tight-fitting masks not allowed to have facial hair facial hair creates a path of least resistance into the mask and hence air will leak into the mask through the facial hair versus going through the filters and that is one of the things we really want to avoid is making sure that basically we have a nice tight seal of the mask on our face while we're wearing the respirator. And one of the things we train in, uh, we do in the training classes is we teach the uh, users of the respirator how to perform a user seal check on the respirator. That user seal check has to be done every time you put the respirator on, right? So at this point, realize the individual has been medically cleared to wear a respirator. He has been fit tested to make sure the respirator actually fits him. He's been trained on how to take care and use the respirator. And then part of that training, we then cover how to do the user seal check, how to basically make sure you do the positive and negative pressure checks. Both checks are required to be done. Uh, before you go into a work area to make sure that you have put the respirator on properly. So as you can see here, you have a positive pressure check, which is where you're covering over the exhalation valve and breathing lightly into the mask to make sure that the mask is not leaking. And then you do a negative pressure check where you cover over the filters and you inhale and hold your breath. And in that holding of the breath, if the mask stays collapsed on your face, you have passed that seal check. If it starts expanding, then basically you have not passed it and you need to adjust the mask to make sure you put it on correctly. So both these checks have to be done every time you've put the respirator on your face before you go into the work area. So um, we hope that you got a lot of information about the hierarchy of respirators and now you understand um, how the, the higher, what the hierarchy is, uh, which respirator is better than which, and hopefully we gave you that information and um, well, that's the end of this course. So here is my contact information if you would like to discuss this information, uh, discuss anything about this course or uh, anything that you're confused on, we'd more than happy to answer any of your questions uh, register for one of our online e-learning courses, schedule an in-person course, or schedule a respirator fit test. You can contact me at my phone number there, the 800 number. You can contact me either by email or through our website. Uh, we also have started a training subscription where you can basically get very good discounts on the various courses that we offer. And so the training subscription is the highest level discount that you can achieve from uh, taking courses through Future Environment Designs. And that is uh, those training subscriptions can be signed up for at the Patron website uh, that you see there on your screen. There are three different levels. You have a basic membership, which just, is, uh, it just includes Safety Susie, which is our monthly newsletter that basically gets into various safety and health issues. Uh, the, uh, the next level is our silver membership, and the silver membership uh, gives you, uh, every month, gives you the Safety Susie newsletter and a silver token to basically use on our in-person, excuse me, e-learning courses. 
And then finally is the last level, which is the VIP membership level. And the VIP forever membership level allows you to convert silver tokens into gold or platinum tokens. And those tokens would be you could be used for uh, basically taking um, in-person classes, uh, some of our half day and full day in-person classes. And by being a member, you get our highest discount uh, for basically becoming a member of Future Environment Designs Training Center, you get the highest discounts that are that are available uh, to uh, people who come to uh, Future Environment Designs for training. So uh, we look forward to seeing you in one of our classes or for a fit test, and we hope this course was uh, enjoyable and um, educational. So be safe and be careful out there.